understand this uh, third episode of the webinar series on business and human rights development in Southern Europe. Uh, the, third Euro the, the third episode is dedicated to Italy. Today we have a, a stellar panel of experts that will be um, telling us about the developments in the field in Italy and I would like to thank them all for accepting our invitation uh, to this webinar which is uh, jointly organized by uh, NOVA um, Centre on Business, Human Rights and the Environment and the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Uh, thank you to my colleague, uh, my colleagues Irene Pietro Paoli and Lisa Smith for their support and their help. And um, without further ado, I will uh, pass the floor to our uh, wonderful chair, uh, Madalena Nelia. She is the director of the Globalization and Human Rights Desk at the FIDH since 2016. She oversees the organization's strategic priorities on promoting respect of human rights by economic players. And she coordinates the Federation's activities on strengthening the international and European regulatory framework on corporate accountability and on improving access to justice for victims of corporate uh, related human rights abuses. Uh, Madalena is also a lecturer in the Corporate Responsibility Master's course at uh, Maastricht University. She's an Italian lawyer by training. She holds a joint PhD in public comparative law uh, and a master's degree in fundamental rights. And prior to joining the FIDH, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Ethics and Law at the University College of London. Uh, Madalena, I will now pass you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much to the NOVA uh, Business and Rights Institute and to Bickled for hosting this event. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will just um, start immediately, I think, the discussion of today because we have a, a round, a rich round of experts who will touch different aspects and, and very interesting topics. Um, our first speaker and expert is Professor Angelica Bonfanti. Uh, Professor Angelica Bonfanti, who will uh, set the scene about and talk uh, and, and will tell us what's the state of the art of business and human rights in Italy, um, especially of business and human rights and access to remedy. Um, she is uh, Associate Professor in International Law and uh, the Head of Studies of the Master Program in Sustainable Development in the Law Faculty of the University of Milan. She teaches their uh, EU, EU law on She is also a member of the coordinating committee of the interest group on international business and human rights at the European Society of International Law, and she's the co-director of the Business and Human Rights uh, Summer School. Angelica is the author uh, of the book uh, Imprese Multinazionali, Diritti Umani e Ambiente, Profili di Diritto Internazionale Pubblico e Privato, uh, a landmark, I would say personally, a landmark book on business and human rights in Italian. Um, and she's also editor of the volume Business and Human Rights in Europe, uh, International Law Challenges. Uh, she also published many articles in international uh, legal journals and collective volumes, such as, for example, the recent report on Italy, private international law for corporate social responsibility that she wrote as Italian rapporteur at the International Academy of Comparative Law. So I will now give the floor to Angelica for this setting the scene. Angelica, you are muted. So here, here am I. Uh, thank you, Madalena, for your kind introduction. And also, uh, let me first of all thank uh, Professor Claire Bright for her uh, kind invitation and uh, the British Institute for International and Comparative Law and the uh, NOVA Law, um, School of Law for uh, convening such an interesting uh, event. With my presentation, uh, I will uh, uh, give uh, a general overview uh, of the recent developments in the business and human rights international framework. Uh, let me just uh, make uh, the screen sharing so I don't uh, waste the time later. Here we are. Uh, okay, sorry. So I will start by 
uh, reminding that uh, Italy has adopted uh, its own uh, national action plan in 2016. Uh, the revised version dates uh, 2018 and uh, identifies uh, five main areas of intervention that are particularly sensitive as uh, Italy is concerned. For instance, environmental protection, uh, opposing discrimination, including gender discrimination, uh, the promotion of um, labor uh, rights within the global, global, global supply chain, and the promotion of uh, processes of human rights uh, uh, due diligence. Uh, now, against this background, uh, I will uh, uh, examine, examine the most relevant steps taken uh, by Italy following the structure of the event list. Thus, I will uh, structure my uh, presentation following the uh, protect, uh, respect, and remedy framework. Um, just to be clear, I will start by the second pillar. So I will start by um, the corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and then I will leave uh, the first pillar for uh, the concluding remarks. So uh, coming to the first uh, uh, point of my analysis, uh, and so uh, focusing on corporate responsibility to respect human rights, so there are several uh, uh, reforms uh, at uh, uh, the level of Italian law that are worthy of consideration. For instance, uh, um, Italy has uh, introduced uh, in 2015 uh, the possibility to constitute benefit corporations. And then uh, as a second element, I would like to remind that uh, um, Italy has enacted uh, the European Directive on the Disclosure of Non-Financial Information in uh, 2016. And as a first step, I would uh, like uh, to um, remind uh, that uh, Italian law provides for a very uh, interesting uh, legal tool, uh, the uh, legislative decree 231 uh, of, uh, the, adopted in 2001. So it is uh, a, on a hold, uh, I would say, legal tool, very uh, relevant to the topic we are uh, focusing on. Since, uh, um, this legislative decree provides for the administrative responsibility of corporations for uh, crimes. Um, so corporations are administratively liable in case they commit any of uh, the several crimes uh, uh, exhaustively listed uh, in the decree. Among uh, uh, the crimes triggering the administrative liability of corporations, the decree uh, lists uh, corruption, environmental crimes, uh, injuries and crimes against pers the persons, uh, uh, the violation of uh, safety standards in the uh, workplace uh, or immigration crimes. So um, it is a very, very uh, interesting uh, and efficient uh, legal tool insofar as uh, it uh, provides for um, uh, sanctions, administrative sanctions. Uh, but on the other end, it does not uh, cover all the uh, human rights violations that uh, corporations are likely uh, to, um, to cause. Uh, thus, um, just to put the question concerning the future developments, uh, I wonder how Italy will, uh, in case, implement uh, uh, the um, European Directive uh, currently under negotiation, uh, the directive, uh, just to make it clearer that uh, mm, uh, the, the European Union is currently negotiating uh, the adoption of a directive uh, that might uh, introduce uh, a, a duty of environmental and human rights due diligence. So in case this directive uh, will be adopted, I wonder how uh, Italy will uh, implement uh, the European instrument at domestic level, uh, whether Italy will uh, either amend uh, legislative decree uh, 231 uh, or enact uh, a new uh, specific piece of legislation tailored on the needs uh, and on the obligations arising from uh, uh, the directive. And as a second um, point uh, uh, of observation, I uh, uh, would like to make some remarks about access uh, to remedy in Italy. 
and um, there are some points worthy of uh, consideration uh, in this um, in this field. Especially in the first of which is the recent introduction uh, at uh, uh, Italian domestic level of uh, the right for the victims of uh, corporate uh, human rights violations to file collective actions uh, for tort liability. So uh, the law was adopted in 2019 and will be um, will enter into force in few days. And they, the, the law might uh, uh, be uh, a very, interesting, very important tool uh, to develop a uh, future case law on the topic we are dealing with. Uh, then, as far as uh, the non-judicial remedies in Italy uh, are concerned, uh, uh, the OECD National Contact Point was established in 2002. And um, since 2019, the uh, National Contact Point has not developed uh, a very um, uh, very strong practice, let's say, but in uh, 2019, uh, uh, I would like to remind that the National Contact Point has um, settled, has adopted the, the final statement in a very interesting case um, against the ENI, the Italian National Gas Company. And uh, we will hear about this case uh, um, through, by uh, one of the next uh, speakers. Um, so uh, I hope that in the future the national contact point will keep uh, in uh, uh, developing such an interesting practice and I wonder uh, maybe whether the national institution might uh, consider um, modifying uh, the, the composition of uh, the OSD uh, national contact point um, as to make it, as to make it uh, inter, an interministerial body and thus uh, maybe more effective uh, um, as concerns the, um, the settlement of uh, cases involving labor and environmental concerns. Um, uh, if uh, we look at the future developments, uh, um, I think it will, it will be uh, interesting to see how, in case the directive uh, will be uh, adopted by the European Union, to see how Italy will enact uh, at the domestic level the provisions uh, um, at the moment uh, uh, established by the directive uh, with reference to the extension of the domestic jurisdiction for cases involving uh, business and human rights, so that the violation of human rights by corporations. So the, um, the directive, in fact, uh, um, asks uh, the member state uh, to extend uh, their jurisdiction, their domestic jurisdiction through, uh, for instance, the provision for the foreign status. And in case of the victims, uh, as far as the uh, identification of the applicable Law is concerned. Coming to uh, the conclusion. So, uh, my impression is that Italy is uh, moving uh, towards uh, interesting developments in the business and human rights uh, field uh, from the classical corporate social responsibility in the direction of uh, corporate accountability. There are still uh, weaknesses that uh, should be improved, and I also have to uh, remind. For instance, Italy has been uh, condemned recently by the European Court of Human Rights in uh, um, the case Cordella versus Italy, concerned with reference to the noxious activities. Uh, uh, performed by uh, Hilva uh, in the southern of Italy in the steel uh, industry. And uh, Italy was considered responsible for the violation of articles 8 and 13 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And uh, then uh, as a very uh, last remark, I would like, uh, would like to um, recall the need that uh, all the business and human rights framework we are focusing on should be uh, read, interpreted, uh, and uh, uh, taken into consideration by the national authorities uh, in the light of the new needs uh, emerging from COVID-19. 
And if we look at the Italian situation, for instance, uh, uh, a very sensitive issue concerns uh, the women uh, protection and uh, women empowerment. Um, that is a very, very sensitive issue uh, for the Italian uh, specific uh, situation. Thus, uh, if I may, I would uh, conclude by um, calling the attention of the uh, Italian uh, authorities to um, take the new uh, tragic uh, needs uh, um, arising in the COVID situation into consideration and to um, adopt uh, the uh, more appropriate uh, legal framework and developments uh, in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Angelica, for this very comprehensive overview who touched also many aspects that we will also um, detail later. And uh, we hope that uh, the Italian authorities will listen to your call. Um, we really hope so. Uh, now, without further ado, I pass to the floor to uh, Dr. Marta Bordignon. Uh, Marta, uh, Dr. Bordignon has a PhD in international law from the University of Rome and in her uh, doctoral thesis she focused on the implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights through national action plans in Italy, Spain and the UK. Currently, Dr. Bordignon is adjunct professor of contemporary politics of Europe, politics of the global economy and legal environment of business at the Temple University in Rome. She is also co-funding and president of the Association of Human Rights International Corner since May 2018. And since 2018, she is also co-director of the Business and Human Rights Summer School. She has been appointed as human rights expert of the Interministerial Committee for Human Rights uh, in July 2020. And she authored several papers and books chapters about the implementation at national level of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, on corporate social responsibility, human rights due diligence, indigenous people rights, and human trafficking and modern slavery. So Marta, I give you the floor. I remember you have 10 minutes for your intervention. Many thanks, Madalena. Um, Angelica, can you stop your screen sharing so I can just start mine? And in the meanwhile, I, I just uh, forgotten to say that Marta will uh, talk to us about the Italian National Action Plan that Angelica uh, mentioned before, and she will dig us deeper into it. Yeah, thank you so much, Madalena Gay, and let me thank you, even on behalf of Human Rights International Corner, to uh, Claire and to Irene for inviting me, but not only me, a lot of friends actually today uh, to this webinar. So as Madalena was saying before, I will just address the um, uh, topic related to the Italian National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, uh, because uh, as maybe many of you uh, perfectly know, that it's my topic uh, uh, and I'm researching something about it since, the, uh, since my PhD actually. Uh, so as you probably know, um, Italy um, has released its national action plan in December 2016. Uh, so uh, it has been one actually at that point, one of the first one, um, and the drafting and consultation process uh, that has been developed throughout 2016, so more or less starting in January 2016, uh, it has followed the uh, guidelines contained in the guidance um, drafted by the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. That is a guidance that has been thus updated several times, and it's just about the drafting and consultation uh, processes and the content of the National Action Plan. Uh, so it has been established a working group composed by not only by institutions, so I mean by the uh, main ministries competent for um, human rights in Italy. Uh, so they have worked together with uh, a series of consultations uh, uh, that at the very beginning were not so public and not so open. So they were just open to a few stakeholders that were that, uh, at that moment moment in both more involved in business human rights in Italy uh, and thus the draft text has been um, officially published uh, in December 2016 where in Italy we were uh, experiencing a very 
a particular moment from a political point of view because uh, there was a government that was resigning at that moment and so the uh, minister for foreign affairs became in like two days the new prime minister and so we have not a real endorsement coming from the government from the italian government to the first version of the initial action plan uh, there is just a preamble that is signed by the uh, then uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs that thus became the Prime Minister. So someone, um, sometimes someone says that there is an endorsement, there is an endorsement by the government, but I don't want to say that actually. Uh, by the way, uh, the very first version of the initial action plan has been released in December 2016, uh, and thus this is the um, internal structure of the initial action plan that, as I told you before, it follows more or less the uh, the one that is, has been suggested by the UN working group. So you have a clear commitment at the beginning uh, that actually has a form of a bullet point uh, where you can find the main commitments coming from the government, the Italian government on business and human rights. But as you have a very first part that is a kind of state of art. Uh, and the third point actually is a very important one that is called expectations towards business. So it's a kind of um, yeah, expectation list uh, uh, drafted by the government towards the Italian businesses. So it's, it's a quite interesting way to approach uh, this topic um, and thus uh, you have the Italian responses so uh, there is a kind of analysis of the main guiding principles um, actually the ones that are contained in the first and in the third pillar um, of the guiding principles uh, the second one is definitely skip uh, that is also quite interesting to know uh, and thus the very last part is the update monitoring and dissemination of the plan. Uh, this is quite interesting because um, in, in 2018, when the Italian government decided to go through the midterm review of the NAP, uh, this part has been actually uh, implemented in some way. And it's also interesting because it's the part that provides for the establishment of the working group uh, uh, on business and human rights that is uh, actually the body that is intended to be the one responsible for implementing and for monitoring the implementation of the initial action plan. Um, okay, so just to uh, recap very briefly for everybody the content of the initial action plan, uh, these are the main um, uh, okay, let's call it pillars again. Uh, the main pillars that you may find in the initial action plan, so more or less all the uh, 57 plan measures that you have in the plan may be uh, just um, divided in these three, in these, sorry, four big clusters. Uh, so in the first one, you have the promotion of human rights, due diligence and transparency, thus state business nexus that, that perfectly recalls what is contained in guiding principles. Uh, that's the vulnerable groups and discrimination. We have some measures that are, for example, directed to uh, vulnerable groups, I mean, like uh, human rights defenders, um, like uh, journalists, or some uh, other ones that are directed to LGBTI representatives and stuff like that. Uh, and thus we have the last point, uh, the last cluster, that is the one about access to remedy, uh, that follows more or less the contain uh, the content, sorry, of the um, third pillar of the guiding principle for sure. Um, so in the following slides, uh, I just list down the measures that could be of, of more interest for us today, even in the light of the uh, speeches that we follow me from my colleagues. So for example, we will definitely speak about law uh, 231. And this is contained measure number one. Uh, I'm sure that Francesca will tell us more about that. Uh, that's uh, something that has already been mentioned by Angelica in, number, uh, in measure number eight. Uh, so the effective implementation of the um, uh, EU Directive on Non-Financial uh, Reporting. Uh, actually, we have already uh, the uh, we have already adopted the implementation uh, decree, so the digital decree, and this measure has been uh, updated in the midterm review version that has been launched two years ago. Um, yeah. Uh, um, exactly two years ago. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, this is another, for example, a really important measure that we will 
uh, address later on today. Uh, thus, uh, again, about uh, due diligence, uh, um, there is actually, uh, an, it's part of the state commitment um, in the national action plan, uh, the promotion that is, you know, like to say, mm, okay, it's, it's for sure a soft approach. Uh, promotion can mean even nothing in, in some cases, uh, but there is the promotion of human rights intelligence with a specific focus to uh, small and medium enterprises that are the majority of enterprises uh, in, the, in the Italian industrial sector. Uh, and uh, so there is also this other measure, number 34, that provides for a special attention uh, to uh, due diligence implementation, uh, even in state-owned enterprises. Okay. So not only in the big ones, not only multinational, and not only small and medium enterprises, but even the uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, that's related to vulnerable groups, as I told you, something that is definitely important apart from the LGBTI uh, rights that I mentioned before, or journalists as human rights defenders is uh, measure number four. Uh, that provides for the strengthening of the law, uh, the role of labor inspections for tackling and controlling the uh, so-called caporalato, uh, that is a form of irregular work that unfortunately is quite common, especially in the uh, southern regions of Italy, but it's not completely true because we have cases of caporalato even in the north, uh, and hopefully there will be time for even uh, addressing uh, this topic that is really, really interesting. Uh, and we have among the, the following speakers some um, experts on that. And that's again number 23 is the one related to diversity management, so linked to the LGBTI aspect that I mentioned before. And here again, I don't want to spend so much time on that because uh, my colleagues know better than me in this part, but it's really interesting to read um, measure number 49 that is. Uh, one, one of the last ones, and it's related to first pillar of the guiding principle, so access to remedy. And uh, I, I want to just draw your attention on the very last point um, of the bullet point containing this measure. So the uh, introduction of the class action, uh, something that actually has uh, happened in some way, but uh, probably again, there will be time for going more deeper on this with my colleagues uh, later on. Uh, just a few words because I think that I have not so many minutes more. Um, so a few words on the reviews. The meter review that happened in 2018 follow more or less the same model that has been adopted for the drafting in 2016. But in this case, um, there were three rounds of multi stakeholder negotiation, open negotiation um, organized. Uh, by the leading authorities that I forgot uh, so far to mention, that is the Interministerial Committee for Human Rights, uh, that is not the national human rights institution in Italy, but it's just an interministerial body. So it's composed by uh, representatives of different ministries and other public institutions in, in Italy. Uh, so uh, there, there has been this kind of free runs consultation, thus uh, a draft uh, uh, version that has been been uh, published online for a public consultation. And thus, we, we had the, the last version that has been presented by the president of the Interministerial Committee for Human Rights at the UN Business and Human Rights Forum in November 2018. Um, and actually, if, mm, if you want to just hear from my remarks from this point of view, uh, what is new and what is more in this uh, midterm review version is definitely about related to training. Uh, first of all, because thanks to um, some of the guys that actually are connected there today, uh, we have now a business human rights summer school in Italy that is co-organized by Human Rights International Corner and other free institutions. And so this is part together with other training courses that are directed to public administrations, uh, for example, or to judges and lawyers in Italy. This is part of the training activities that were provided by the National Action Plan, the Italian National Action Plan. Um, and the other maybe news that we have is the metrics, so that is the, the, the annex to the meet review uh, NAP. Um, and these are metrics where you can find all the competent authorities for each one of the 57 measures. So in theory, you may you know, like 
reach out each one of the administrations and ask for um, to what extent they have implemented or not the measure uh, for which they are competent. So um, actually nothing has happened so much so far in Italy about the implementation of the 57 measures. Uh, there has not been an assessment, uh, like a midterm assessment before the review. So this is something that for example, it's not definitely in line with the uh, suggestions and the provisions coming from all the guidance and the guidelines that we have so far about NAPS. Um, so the metrics is okay, as it's something that has been asked for many times by the Italian civil society organization, including uh, Human Rights International Corner, but uh, it's just, you know, uh, a very, uh, a very small step in terms of uh, replying to the request coming, uh, for, for example, from the civil society. But in any case, we have the implementation uh, matrix, and this is, you know, is a, at least something um, in terms of implementation. But again, we missed the assessment, and this is, I think, uh, more important to be underlined. Uh, I want to just conclude uh, with um, a very quick remark about something that has been um, done exactly one year ago because it happened uh, in on November 20 um, sorry November 11th of 2019 uh, we I mean me together with Angelica Bon Fanti, Marco Pasciglione, uh, Chiara Macchi, they are the co-directors of the summer school or the business uh, humor summer school we have drafted and sent to the Italian uh, authorities an open letter that has been signed by many others that are online today with us uh, so many experts or in any case many uh, people involved in business and human rights in italy and we wrote to the uh, current government um, for asking for um, for a kind of business and human rights roadmap in italy because we we have the national action plan but again um, it means for sure uh, a strong implementation uh, so we have sent out the letter to the main authorities, but we didn't have any kind of feedback from them or any kind of reply. So this is, you know, just to add something more to the uh, to the state of art in terms of national action plan in Italy. Um, in theory, I have a lot of uh, more to say, but I think that I want to stop here. So maybe I I, I, um, I don't know if I have spent all my 10 minutes, but more or less. Yes, more than. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madalena. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much for this, um, this comprehensive analysis of the Italian National Action Plan. And actually, something that was mentioned by, uh, both by you, Marta, and by Angelica uh, at the beginning is this uh, legislative decree number 231 of 2001. So now we will go uh, a little bit deeper into it to understand better what this is and how it works. And to do that, uh, we have with us um, Dr. Francesca Cucchiara. Uh, Francesca is an Italian lawyer uh, who provides assistance in human rights cases related to criminal law and immigration law, uh, acting before national, European, and international courts, including uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Francesca holds a PhD in public law, international, and criminal justice at the University of Pavia, and she is also co-founder of Human Rights International Corner, uh, the Italian NGO committed um, to raise awareness on business and human rights that we, we already mentioned. Uh, she is also co-author of a report on Italian legislative decree number 231 of 2001, as a model for uh, human rights due diligence legislation, uh, which was realized together with FIDH and with the support of um, ECCJ and Breath for the World. So I will now give the floor to Francesca. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madalena, for uh, introducing me. Thank you to the Nova University and the British Institute. And thank you to Professor Claire Bright for giving me the opportunity uh, to take part to this interesting uh, uh, webinar. So um, I will uh, try to give you a short overview of uh, um, Italian Legislative Decree 231-2001. Uh, Let me do the sharing. Um, as already mentioned, both by Professor Bonfanti and uh, by my colleague uh, Marta Bordignon, um, uh, the uh, decree uh, is uh, one of the 
uh, most relevant uh, due diligence pro mm, let's clarify uh, since the beginning that uh, the decree um, is not uh, can you sorry can you hear me madalena because yes we yeah. can hear it, it there was a little bit of uh, i think delay while you were sharing the screen okay. and now and now it's a uh, text i think that's perfect so uh, I, I, just, I was just saying um, that it's important to clarify that the purpose of the decree was not to uh, protect human rights. Uh, it was uh, adopted in 2001 uh, to comply with the uh, anti-bribery uh, international convention. Um, and uh, to do uh, that, uh, on the one hand, it introduced for the first time in Italy corporate responsibility for crime committed in the interest or to the advantage of a legal entity. On the other hand, it also introduced a due diligence process uh, that corporations uh, uh, should uh, adopt and undertake uh, in order to avoid this kind of responsibility. Uh, there was a um, uh, a debate uh, among uh, uh, Italian scholars and uh, uh, in the case law uh, with regard to uh, the nature of such uh, liability. Uh, since, uh, as Professor Bonfandi uh, mentioned, the uh, law labeled um, the, this, la this liability as an administrative responsibility. However, uh, the Italian Supreme Court, uh, considering the strict connection uh, uh, with uh, criminal liability, um, um, clarified that uh, uh, this is not an administrative liability, but it's a tertium genus, a third part a third type of hybrid uh, responsibility uh, between the administrative one and the criminal one. Um, despite uh, uh, not being uh, um, specifically directed uh, uh, at protecting human rights, um, the scope of uh, the decree has been extended over years, and today it includes uh, several human rights violations. You can see here a, a list, and it also includes uh, um, uh, severe in environmental uh, violations. And uh, it's important to say that uh, some of the most uh, of the most uh, relevant and uh, um, and um, famous cases, uh, which led to uh, uh, liability under uh, Legislative Decree 231. 2001 uh, are related to uh, human rights uh, uh, violations. For example, uh, the ThyssenKrupp case and the ILVA case already mentioned. Um, let's now uh, see uh, what are the legal requirements to be met uh, in order um, um, to uh, um, for the 231 liability to arise. So first of all, one of the crimes listed in the decree uh, has to be committed in the interest or to the advantage of the corporation. Um, secondly, uh, the uh, crime has to be uh, committed by a representative of the corporation, uh, either an employee or uh, an high level employee manager director, uh, uh, member of the board, uh, and uh, third, uh, an organizational fault has to uh, occur. Uh, organizational fault is a, a core concept of, uh, um, uh, of the legal regime established by Legislative Decree 231 and uh, refers to the adoption uh, and to the effective implementation of compliance uh, programs. Uh, or organizational models, specifically designed to prevent the commission of, uh, uh, of crimes. Um, actually, uh, the decree does not provide for a legal obligation to adopt uh, uh, these uh, uh, organizational models, but the adoption and the implementation of the models are conditions to uh, avoid liability. Um, they, uh, uh, the adoption uh, of the uh, model um, um, imply um, a, a due diligence process to identify, prevent, and mitigate uh, the risk of uh, the commission of specific crimes. And this process has to be uh, an ongoing process since uh, uh, the model, once adopted, has to be uh, constantly reviewed uh, and, and has to take account of any change in the business 
business activity or uh, structure or uh, any change in the law, in the criminal, in the relevant criminal law. Uh, um, in addition, the uh, 231 decree also uh, requires um, company to uh, institute an internal but independent supervisory body called Organismo di Vigilanza, uh, which has the task of uh, monitoring the uh, implementation of the compliance programs described by uh, the uh, 231 model and to address uh, any eventual uh, violation. Um, the 231 decree also addresses some issues concerning access to justice, um, considering the, the strict link with the, the commission of a crime and with the, uh, criminal law, um, criminal law and criminal procedure applies, um, which is a positive thing considering the wide powers uh, of investigation that public prosecutors uh, enjoy in our legal system. Uh, but uh, uh, this also uh, um, have some, um, let's say, uh, weaknesses. Uh, first of all, as you know, uh, criminal law requires a high burden of proof. And uh, um, secondly, uh, there was also a, um, a legal debate on admissibility of civil action. Uh, that is to say, to explain it in a very simple way, uh, victims try to claim for damages uh, within the uh, criminal procedure. Uh, legislative decree 231 2001 did not mention uh, admissibility of the, the, the quest the issue of uh, admissibility of, of, of civil action and this omission um, uh, broke the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Italian Supreme Court um, uh, to uh, declaring that uh, uh, admissibility of civil action had to be uh, excluded. And uh, let's say sensitive cases uh, like the Ilva case and the case concerning the Andrea Corato train wreck, um, they um, um, the trial courts uh, uh, granted the victims the right to, uh, um, to claim damages directed against the legal entity. So there, there are uh, um, positive uh, developments in the, in the case law on, on this point. Um, in addition, um, it's uh, important to uh, mention the fact that uh, um, corporations and multinational groups uh, operating abroad are also um, um, liable, uh, uh, um, uh, could also consider, could be also considered uh, liable under the decree. First of all, foreign companies operating in Italy uh, could be considered liable uh, under uh, uh, 231 decree, but also uh, foreign and in Italian corporations uh, operating abroad can be considered liable in case of crimes committed partially in Italy, partially abroad. And in a um, uh, set of very specific uh, cases, also when the offenses are occurred entirely abroad. So um, in order to uh, conclude and to make uh, a comparison with uh, the human rights due diligence uh, requirement, uh, you can see that uh, uh, 231 uh, decree um, has significant strengths, uh, but it also has uh, some uh, weaknesses, uh, um, basically deriving from the fact that uh, its purpose was not uh, to protect human rights. Uh, for example, not all the human rights abuses are uh, uh, listed in the decree, um, and uh, uh, the decree does not provide for any requirement uh, for stake stakeholder engagement. That is to say that the due diligence process that corporations are uh, um, uh, invited to, to undertake uh, to adopt the 231 uh, uh, models are just internal ones. And often they are also um, uh, not disclosed, um, also because the, um, uh, the sensitive activities that are described in a 231 models, uh, companies are not likely to uh, publish them. So there is also a lack of transparency. And, uh, um, um, 
maybe uh, hopefully uh, these uh, these weaknesses uh, could be addressed uh, uh, in the framework of the implementation of the future uh, of the future EU law um, uh, EU directive on uh, human rights due diligence. So um, I. Uh, just for the one for the ones uh, who uh, would like to uh, go a bit deeper uh, on the topic, I, I, I leave here the link to our uh, report on uh, on uh, two three one uh, legislative decree. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca, uh, for also describing a bit a bit uh, more in detail this uh, interesting piece of legislation was often overlooked when we talk about human rights due diligence and uh, and also now there is a lot of discussion about liability as well how to do it together um, so it's, it's a very interesting example um, now we will go uh, to, to talk a bit uh, more in detail about a specific uh, let's say cases um, and we will do that with uh, Giacomo, Giacomo Cremonesi, who is a, a lawyer uh, working at the Cagliazza and Partners International Law Firm in Milan. Uh, he is the co-founder and member of the executive board of uh, Human Rights International Corner Association. Uh, and he's also the former member of the Human Rights Commission of the Italian National Bar Council. Uh, he is a lawyer that is committed to human rights litigation before national, European and international courts, including mediation in front of non-judicial bodies, such as the OECD National Contact Point. And uh, it's exactly about the OECD National Contact Points that Giacomo will talk today. Thank you. Giacomo. Thank you, Maddalena. Grazie mille. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to UNOVA and to the British Institute. Um, today, I'm going to talk very briefly about the Italian National Contact Point and especially about the specific case that I participated in uh, in the last uh, three years. Um, so, as uh, Angelica said at the beginning, um, the National Contact Point, uh, the Italian National Contact Point, um, received a very low number of cases up to now and especially up to 2017 when we started our case um, in front of the body and um, this is probably due to the fact that there is a lack of awareness of this instrument in Italy and the fact that probably there is a bit of a lack of resources to, to the body. Um, so when we, um, when we started our cases, only eight cases were brought in front of the National Cotton Point and no one led to an agreement, so uh, not a positive outcome so far. Um, for this reason, uh, the case I'm about to speak, we brought uh, not just to the Italian National Contact Point, but also to the Dutch National Contact Point, because it was considered to be a bit more active. But it has to be said that at the end, the Italian took the lead. And um, as you will see, we also reached an agreement at the end. So we, we're happy with the outcome, even if it has to be said that this is the only case we reached an agreement so far. And 10 cases um, were brought in front of the Italian National Contact Point uh, up to date. Um, so um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a problem, a human rights problem that is arising in the Aga community. The Aga community is uh, a community based in Nigeria, in the River State, and um, they ex are experiencing uh, heavy flooding during the rainy season. And the community believes that those flooding are uh, caused or at least contributed to cause uh, by the activity and the infrastructure built by the ENI um, company. Uh, as you can see, in the 70s, the um, in the 70s. ENI went to, to Aga and built some oil wells. Uh, and those oil wells were connected by some access road that are elevated from the ground. And uh, when the rainy season comes and um, they, they are forming some natural stream of water. And apparently those stream of water goes against these roads that are elevated to the ground and goes back and flooding the community. This is what is believed by the 
by the community, or at least by this Egbena Voices Freedom with the applicant, and was also kind of uh, established by the Ministry of Environment of Nigeria. For some years, they tried to uh, remediate to this solution by accessing court in Nigeria, but apparently uh, there was no positive uh, outcome. Um, so every year uh, there are flooding in Aga, and um, every year uh, people are suffering human rights uh, and environmental problems. And the human rights spectrum touched is uh, quite broad. We did an impact assessment report based on surveys, and we found out they like 90% of people had to relocate from their homes, 90% of, of the households described loss of agricultural product, uh, problem with water supplies, water problem with education because a school uh, was flooded, and um, problem with the recreation center, and a lot of obviously uh, health problems, physical injuries, skin problems, etc. You can find this uh, survey, this impact assessment on the Advocates for Our Community Alternative website. Um, this is uh, the situation uh, was like this until we decided to uh, go in front of the uh, to go in front of the uh, Italian national contact point. And uh, um, the applicant was this Igbema Voice of Freedom, this uh, association of the community. Plus, uh, we had. Uh, um, among the complainants, uh, the lawyer Chima Williams, advocates for community alternative, myself, I gave my help, and we had also the support of uh, FIDEASH. And um, we went to the national contact point, not asking for money, not asking for compensation for the victim, even if obviously uh, people needed that. But what we wanted to do, because this is a problem that went on and on for more than 20 years, we wanted to solve the problem. So we went there to just to ask the company to do something to create a drainage system adequate to solve the problem. And uh, we had um, a positive initial assessment by the uh, National Contact Point, who appointed a special mediator, who is a well known professional in international law in Italy. And uh, we went on with the procedure. And um, at the end, uh, after uh, one year and a half of this procedure going on with one in-person meeting in Milano and two uh, meetings in Nigeria between the parties, uh, the parties reached an agreement. And uh, so any committed to, um, to create an adequate drainage system or at least do some work to go in that direction. And if those work would not uh, succeed, then we will have an, an independent expert to uh, find uh, uh, and to give other suggestions to solve the problem. Um, this agreement can be found on the website of the uh, Italian National Contact Point and also the detail of the case. Um, what I can say about the, uh, the National Contact Point in general and especially about my case is that um, what is a very a plus and what is very important is the fact that when you have an mediation, first you have the opportunity to, in a way, bridge the liability gap because you have in front of you both the parent company and the uh, subsidiary company. And you also have the opportunity for members of the community to be there at the table and speak with them and have a confrontation and a dialogue between them, which is not always the case if you bring a judicial case where just lawyers are dealing with, with the staff and then the community feels like something distant is going on. And of course, if the outcome is positive, then they feel happy. But if the outcome is negative, they feel that they were not part of the process that went on. Um, and also, the admissibility uh, is, of course, uh, criteria for admissibility are lower in the national contact point, even if uh, OECD Watch is criticizing a lot national contact points around the world because many in many cases uh, the uh, admissibility is denied for different reasons and this should not be the case because a mediation should always be allowed. But um, again, compared to uh, judicial court, a non-judicial body like that provide you a low, a more possibility to have your case heard. Um, we are now in the implementation phase 
and uh, we are experiencing trouble and delays and uh, we hope that uh, at the end we will have a positive result. Um, if you want uh, again more information about the case, uh, the, it, it's been transparent. The national contact point is published all the uh, document and describing the case uh, in general, and there is also published the agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you very much also for for this presentation, who also brings a little bit more, uh, let's say, concrete flesh to the discussion we are having so far. Um, so now uh, we are going towards the conclusion of uh, the presentations of the of the panel. Uh, just before uh, calling the last uh, presenter, I just want to um, to say that we will have some time for Q and A, maybe fifteen minutes. But if you have already questions uh, on the presentations that have uh, taken place so far, and you want to write them in the chat, that will save save us some time, so we will be able to take more questions on board. So feel free to do that. And now um, I will turn uh, to um, Dr. Marco Fasciglione for uh, the hard task of giving a a conclusive remarks to this very uh, comprehensive presentation we heard today. Um, Dr. Fasciglione is a researcher of international human rights law at the National uh, Research Inst Institute, um, the Italian CNR, uh, since 2011, where uh, he is um, principal uh, researcher of the uh, of a research project on corporate human rights and environmental due diligence and the promotion of the corporate responsibility. Uh, Marco is a, uh, an expert on business and human rights and is also the co-director of the Summer School on Business and Human Rights in Italy. Uh, he is former legal officer at the European Court of Human Rights and currently is an alternate member of the management board of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. So Marco, to you for this uh, conclusive uh, remarks. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay, perfectly. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Madalena. Thank you very much. Um, let me join to the um, uh, thanks to Claire Bright and all the Irene and, and Lisa Smith um, and Irene Petropaoli for uh, this kind invitation uh, to this webinar. Um, uh, with uh, such uh, such a distinguished speakers uh, and friends and colleagues. Um, yes, as Madalena anticipated, to I have I have uh, uh, the the hard the hard task to uh, draw some um, the main line um, of this of the analysis made uh, this morning. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to, to um, yes, can you see the slide? The sh okay, uh, so I'm going to, 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 to do some quick remarks um, uh, as the main points that I, um, I, I have heard uh, today by, by, by in, in the speeches that, that um, um, made um, by uh, previous speakers. So let's um, uh, let's start in the first place from the uh, uh, mentioned by Angelica, by Marta, and all the other speakers uh, of this um, uh, transitional phase that we are experiencing now from CSR to uh, to BHR to business and human rights. Um, Probably this is only uh, a starting phase. Um, I don't think that um, uh, we are really uh, far ahead in this in this path. Um, and the the main problem is that um, if we look to the debate on on business and human rights in Italy. Um, and also from the point of view of the institutions, of the, the, the public institution, institutions concerned by the debate, um, there is a, a kind of a, a, an overlapping between CSR and, B, and BHR uh, with an excessive uh, weight attributed to corporate social responsibility um, instead of um, uh, business and human rights discourse. 
so um, we need to uh, probably uh, clarify that uh, C CSR and business and human rights are not the same um, uh, as uh, corporate social responsibility uh, is essentially uh, meant in 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 the meaning of in in the term of philanthropy, um, uh, while uh, while business and human rights is focused on the uh, necessity to prevent human rights violations during corporate activities. Uh, this uh, feature the prevention side, the, 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 the preventive side is absent in uh, normal, in traditional corporate social responsibility agenda. Uh, second point, um, as far as the, um, uh, the development of corporate liability for human rights violation in Italian legal system. Here, the point is, according to my opinion, and but I think also um, uh, it, it, what, what is uh, stemming from uh, your speeches uh, today, is the necessity to reinforce both judicial, uh, judicial remedies and non-judicial remedies. Um, so, from the perspective of uh, judicial remedies, um, we can uh, I, I, can, I, I agree with uh, the position uh, of um, Francesca Cucchiara, but also with the words uh, from Angelica Bonfanti as far as the effectiveness of the legislative decree 231, as far as uh, its uh, ability to protect human rights from corporate violations. Uh, um, in other terms, in the decree uh, uh, with its, uh, um, with its um, um, scope of application is a useful model, of course, for criminal law schemes. Uh, uh, so we could apply, um, we could apply this, this scheme, this decree, uh, when our aim is to punish gross violations of human rights, uh, such as use Kogan's norms, the, the prohibition of slavery, the labor exploitation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera. But I feel uh, that it is hard to expand uh, such a, uh, uh, the scope of application of the legislative decree um, to in a, in, in a form of, uh, covering a general corporate liability for human rights abuses. Uh, probably here we need to couple to to integrate uh, criminal uh, law sanction under the legislative decree with civil civil liability schemes. Um, going on, okay, uh, uh, my uh, previous speakers have 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 um, uh, correctly highlighted. The, um, the, the, the the adoption in Italy in 2019 of the uh, collective action uh, civil liability schemes, uh, um, the, the so-called the class action uh, act. Um, this um, again may might be a useful instrument in order to uh, to. Uh, to uh, address human rights abuses um, within corporate uh, activities, but of course, again, we need to um, we need to uh, amend this uh, this legislation in order to include um, uh, specific options on um, as far as this uh, um, this issue. On the other side, uh, I think also that, that um, as emerged by the um, speaks from, from uh, Marta and from uh, Giacomo Cremonesi and Marta Bordignon, uh, non-judicial remedies are also um, uh, an important point uh, in order to, um, to uh, create effective remedies uh, even uh, at national level as far as um, corporate uh, human rights violations. Uh, here I share the um, not very good analysis, not very good 
um, uh, analysis made by uh, Giacomo and Marta Esvarez, the effectiveness of, of um, OECD national contact points experience. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we could say, we, we, we can say that um, NCP um, national contact point cases uh, demonstrate generally, so, so, so worldwide, uh, in the system, in the, in the general system of the national contact points, uh, real success uh, due to several reasons. The most important uh, problems concern the lack of independence and lack of transparency. Uh, I think that Italian national contact point uh, uh, is not very far from these uh, problems and uh, does not make, make an exception to as far as this situation. Um, so, um, uh, however, we need to, to, to reinforce non-judicial remedies and uh, um, Angelica Bonfante and Marta mentioned the potential role of national human rights institutions. This is a, a, a thematic, a topic which is uh, um, very uh, close to me um, because as, as a, a member of the management board of the FRA, uh, we are deeply involved in the, um, in the promoting um, strong and effective national human rights institutions. Well, um, as you know, uh, uh, national human rights institutions are institutions which are established by uh, law or under constitution um, with the mandate to protect and promote human rights at national level. In accordance with the international human rights norms and standards, uh, um, consider please that national human rights institutions are expressly mentioned within uh, UNGPs, uh, Principle 3, uh, and so they are really an important institution in order to, uh, to uh, give effectiveness to human right, uh, business and human rights uh, from the perspective of non-judicial remedies. Um, what's, what is the problem in Italy? Uh, as Man Marta mentioned before, uh, in Italy, we do not have a, a, a national human rights institution. Um, um, the, and this notwithstanding the, the fact that Italy has um, uh, several times uh, um, committed itself to adopt, introduce to, to establish a national human rights institution. Uh, uh, Italy is with Malta, the uh, uh, only two countries, European countries without a national institution of human rights. Uh, is there a place, is there a role for national human rights institution as far as business and human rights agenda? Of course there is. Uh, we have a lot of, 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 of cases, a lot of, of situations in which in other countries worldwide, uh, national human rights institutions are um, involved in the business and human rights debate. Uh, just for a couple of examples, uh, Canada Ombudsperson on Responsible Enterprises, which is a national human rights institution with specific competence on business and human rights, has jurisdiction over Canadian companies and their overseas operations and may receive claims of human rights abusing, abuses um, uh, uh, arise, uh, arising from the operations of Canadian companies, uh, uh, even, even, even uh, for their extraterritorial activities. Um, uh, uh, quite similarly, uh, la Commission Nationale Consultative des Droits de l'Homme uh, in, uh, in France um, has some limited powers on, 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 on uh, in, uh, as far as the business and human rights debate, um, having the possibility to render consultative opinions, recommendations, and performing uh, examination and investigations. Um, la, la Commission Nationale um, adopted several uh, AV, several opinion, uh, opinions um, as far as um, business and human rights. Um, we already said of the uh, scanty process as far as national human rights institution in Italy. Um, uh, let me skip to uh, the third point, uh, which emerged in the debate today, which is the uh, um, role of the state duty to protect, you know, which is what I uh, call the remedial side of the moon 
uh, when we uh, take the perspective of access to remedies. I mean, um, I mean, um, uh, when we look to uh, to the state duty to protect, we have to um, we have to consider that the state duty to protect has a preventive dimension that is the obligation to take uh, measures for preventing violation of human rights by private actors, but also a remedial uh, dimension uh, which is uh, sometimes forgotten, and it is not for case that that. Uh, the third pillar has been also defined as the forgotten pillar, the, the third pillar of the UNGPs. Uh, this remedial dimension um, encompasses the obligation to take measures for remedying violation of human rights uh, by private uh, private actors. Well, um, this is enshrined uh, in UNGP uh, 25, um, where uh, it is um, said that a state must take appropriate steps to ensure through judicial, administrative, legislative and appropriate means um, uh, that when uh, corporate human rights abuses occur within their territory or jurisdiction, those affected have access to effective remedies. Uh, this is, of course, uh, a principle which is, um, which is, uh, um, which is part of the uh, state responsibility uh, system of international law. Um, so this means that if states does not assure uh, effective access to remedies, they may be sued before international court and tribunals um, um, having uh, competence to uh, and operating under the main human rights international instruments, international or regional instruments. Oh. This is the case, uh, for instance, of the European Court of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, we have a bulk of case law uh, from the European Court of Human Rights, um, which uh, uh, tell us that uh, member states of the European Convention of Human Rights are, um, have a duty to, um, to um, establish uh, and to assure access, uh, to establish remedy, to, to assure access for the victims of human rights violations within their national legal system. Uh, the case law of the European Court of Human Rights covers several areas from the environmental hazard associated to corporate conduct. Uh, um, Angelica uh, mentioned the Cordella et, al et Altri and others versus Italy, but we have Guerran and others versus Italy, uh, Fadeyeva versus Russia, Honorary Deals versus Turkey, and many other cases. Um, um, there is also the, the, uh, an important area concerning the treatment contrary to human dignity. Uh, so uh, situation involving labor exploitations, um, such as in the case Chauduri and others versus Greece, um, as well as uh, situations covering concerning the right to privacy and uh, uh, employers versus employee surveillance. surveillance uh, as um, it was the case in Barbulescu versus Romania in 2017. Um, so in, in, in all these cases, the European Court of Human Rights has established, has confirmed the principle that there is a, um, a general a state positive obligation in the remedy area that is to um, take all the necessary steps to address uh, these violations set to, uh, to, to allow uh, victims to access to uh, remedies in order to avoid denial of justice. There is a, 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 a brocardo, a Latin brocardo, which, um, which describes perfectly the situation, um, ubi ucb remedium, where there is a right, there is a remedy. Um, which is the consequence of this of this um, situation? Well, that state, states have to eliminate barriers and, uh, or fill uh, the gaps of their uh, domestic domestic legal systems um, uh, in order to 
uh, allow um, an effective access to judicial uh, remedies uh, for victims of uh, violations, even in the business and human rights field area. Uh, so we could um, we could um, uh, um, we could say that that there is a, an obligation an obligation of states which are not in um, whose legal system are not consistent with the, 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 the international case law practice, there is an obligation to legislate by, by um, amending and adopting within their legal system um, uh, legislation and an avenue may, may, see, may, may be, may be uh, adopting uh, mandatory human rights due diligence legislations. Uh, finally, uh, some uh, COVID uh, and business and human rights uh, um, um, observations in inspired by uh, the, the reflection of Angelica Bonfanti. I have published a paper, uh, an article on uh, the European papers uh, law journal recently, um, uh, just on this topic. Um, so uh, we have, we have um, um, also in Italy, uh, the problem of concern the, of the impact of COVID-19 uh, uh, um, as far as the activity of uh, corporations and as far as the duty of both state and corporations in order to prevent violations stemming from the uh, measure uh, that uh, companies may adopt or not uh, in order to, to uh, avoid uh, the spread of the pandemic contagion. Um, there are shared responsibilities both on state and on, and on, and on companies. Um, um, we had, um, uh, we had uh, legal um, uh, legal instruments such as the Decreto Cura Italia, uh, who established, which established um, uh, that uh, some case sector have to um, continue to um, to work. They have to continue to to um, to uh, perform uh, business activities, that their ordinary uh, activities, working activities, uh, due to their essentiality. Uh, such as healthcare situations or uh, logistic and public transport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we had also several um, cases concerning the gig economy, the riders, uh, and their low level of protection for their, uh, for their health. Uh, some tribunals ordered the companies of the gig economy uh, employing riders to, um, uh, to um, provide these uh, persons with the health devices necessary, such as the masks, the gloves, uh, which they failed to provide. Uh, of course, there are also uh, um, several problems also from the perspective of the supply chains um, uh, as far as COVID-19. Um, uh, there is no time to, to, to deep this uh, also, these these um, uh, these uh, um, these um, uh, argument, this topic. Uh, so um, I'm going to um, uh, draw some conclusion. Where are we now in the path towards business and human rights in Italy? Uh, well, I think that um, we are on the. Um, um, just at the beginning, as I told in the, at the beginning of my of my of my speech, um, we are at the, at the inception of the of the path towards uh, um, uh, the building of a legal system concerning business and human rights at the national level. Um, for the moment, the debate has focused largely and mainly on the corporate social responsibility approach. And uh, so um, we need to reinforce just this, uh, uh, this, this, um, these elements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. And, and thanks uh, also to all the other speakers for this very, uh, I would say, deep and, and rich discussion. 
I would now um, open the floor for uh, Q&A. We have uh, 10 minutes for to do that. So um, if you wish to ask a question to the panel, uh, please raise your hand uh, in the tool, uh, clicking on participants, and then you have the raising hand tool. Um, and uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask, tell us who you want to ask the question to. Let me see. Ah, yes, Claire. Uh, perhaps uh, while everyone is warming up, I can uh, I can get started if, if that's okay. Um, so thank you all for for this extremely interesting uh, presentations, uh, which triggered uh, a few questions to me. Um, so first of all, several of you, Angelica, Marco, in particular, mentioned that new law on collective actions, which um, uh, I find really interesting. Um, and I just wondered, um, so I'm assuming this is a law that wasn't necessarily introduced just in relation to business and human rights claims. Um, in fact, I think Marco, you said that it might need some uh, improvements to, um, to adapt to this sort of claims. I, I just wanted uh, what was the opinion of, of Angelica and Marco on, on this issue and how could that law be helpful in the context of business and human rights claims. Um, I also found uh, really interesting the uh, remarks um, uh, of Giacomo in relation to the mediation and the potential that the, um, the mediation could play in having a more, uh, I suppose, a less adversarial effect of bringing the communities um, to the table. And so my question to you, Giacomo, would be more from a, a practical perspective. Uh, as a lawyer having been involved in this sort of cases, how does it work to involve uh, communities that are um, that live quite far away in this, in this process in practice? If you could tell, tell us a bit more about it. So that's it for now. Thank you. Yes. So first, uh, first to, before going to the panel, there was another question. So I will uh, collect uh, those who are there. Um, I see a question from Anju Rani. Yeah, can I speak? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. So it's evening in India. So my name is Anjo, I'm an advocate by profession and I'm from India. So my question is for Mr. Marcusa. So the question is like, as, as you have discussed that there is no human right commission in Italy. So how you, uh, so if there is uh, anything infringement of the rights of the people to whom you move, to which authority you go for the case? Hmm. Thank yeah. you very much. And uh, just allow me to take the, the last question I see before to go to go the floor to the panel uh, from Claudia Pinessi. Please go ahead. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, I came from uh, University of Milan and uh, I just wanted to ask uh, to Giacomo Cremonesi, uh, why in the e ENI case, uh, they decided to go before uh, uh, a national contact point and not uh, against uh, the judicial remedies. And why, in this time, uh, uh, national contact uh, the remedies with uh, national contact point uh, had succeeded and the other times not? Yes. Thank you very much. So I will now turn to the to the panelists for our first round. Maybe uh, we can start from Angelica. Yes, uh, thanks for the question. That gives me the opportunity to go a little bit and the taste on one of the most interesting developments on, uh, on the landscape, let's say. Uh, yes, the law was introduced last year and uh, should have already entered into force, but it was postponed. And then uh, in, on 19 November, the entry into force is foreseen for the 19th of November. And uh, Let's say that I think it would bring, it will, it might bring um, good developments or interesting developments uh, in terms of uh, giving the victims the possibility to join in groups and uh, filing collective claims for tort liability. So um, I see, uh, I mean, my impression is that uh, here in Italy, we, we don't have a comparable case law if uh, compared with other 
European countries, for instance, not only uh, due to specificities of outdoor uh, procedural system of law, but also because of uh, the, the lack uh, until now of these possibilities for the, for the victims to, to join together and reduce costs and difficulties, for instance. So uh, I think this might uh, work as a good uh, instrument to raise awareness and reduce costs uh, and give them the possibility to join uh, and um, initiate proceedings that uh, until now we, we, we haven't seen. I don't think it's the only reason why in Italy we don't have a comparable uh, case law, but uh, this is for sure uh, an interesting instrument to start uh, dealing seriously uh, with the topic. I don't know whether Marco wants to add uh, some critical elements now. <laughs> No, thank you, Angelica. Okay. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, thank you, Andrew, for your questions. Um, as far as the Claire um, questions, I, Angelica, I subscribe your point of view. Uh, I think um, the, uh, the the situation is exactly as you have described. It, so I don't want to to to, to um, uh, stay longer on this on these topics. Uh, I want to uh, answer to um, Andrew questions, which is strictly uh, linked to, connected to, to, to this situation, uh, which is um, the effectiveness of civil judicial remedies in Italy. Um, well, uh, uh, in the first place, uh, national human rights institution uh, in Italy is, um, is absent. Uh, but uh, even if um, a national human rights institution would exist, uh, it, uh, we, we have to, um, we don't know which kind of powers uh, such institution uh, might be um, attributed. Um, probably um, and arguably uh, um, uh, such a, an institution will not have uh, uh, the power to condemn to civil liability companies. Uh, if we if we look the to the experience of other countries of a national human rights institution in other countries, this is this is uh, more or less uh, a quite a common a common element. Um, however, it. Uh, this institution might uh, adopt recommendation, might uh, uh, also adopt a decision imposing some, uh, indicating some uh, measure to adopt for companies violating human rights. And of course, also, also, uh, also for states, if the case. Um, so, um, uh, due to this absence, which other kind of, of uh, solution have individuals um, a victim of human rights abuses in Italy uh, when these abuses are, happens, happen within um, business operations? Uh, the, the ordinary um, use of, of, of uh, tribunals um, uh, is the main path, is the main route to, 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 to perform, um, uh, to be performed, to be, to, to be, to be used by, by, by victims. Of course, uh, with all the problems that this, uh, um, this, um, this route uh, um, may have, uh, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking to the uh, problems concerning the extraterritorial application of uh, Italian law for overseas uh, uh, activities of, of Italian of Italian companies, um, the any the recent any case in Milan was was um, more or less uh, clear from this point of view. Um, so, which other kind of solution have individuals victim of business and human rights violations to use uh, all the instances existing at international and regional uh, level 
uh, an example is the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, once they have exhausted all the uh, domestic remedies, uh, as far as the European Court of Human Rights legal system is concerned, um, in order to, to, uh, um, uh, to get the, um, um, to ask to the, these tribunals to condemn states for having omitted uh, to protect their rights uh, within um, uh, business activities. Thank you, Marco. Then I will turn to Giacomo for uh, the last questions. Yes. Um, so very briefly, that there are very few time. Um, so to ask uh, Claire how to involve a community which is based in Nigeria, which this is very difficult. And um, Luckily, uh, we had Chima Williams and Jonathan Kaufman. Chima Williams is based in Nigeria. Jonathan Kaufman is based in Ghana, but is, was in constant contact with the community. We had almost weekly a call with uh, the leader of the Egbema Voice of Freedom, and uh, we're organizing meeting and the community was mobilized there. So uh, it was a lot, a lot of activity to, to be all the time in the same page. And it can be seen now that in the implementation phase, when we do not talk to each other for one month or two months, because of course we are no more in the mediation, but we are in a phase where the work has to be carried out. Uh, you lose a bit the contact and you lose a bit uh, the, the possibility to know what is going on day by day. But this is not just with an African community. This is in everyday work of the lawyer. When you don't see the client for a long time, you don't talk to him, you don't have a, the, clo the, the close connection, you, you lose contact with what's going on in the real world. And this is always a challenge. And um, to, the, to answer uh, what uh, uh, Claudia Pinesi was asking, we, um, the several cases or some cases were brought judicial cases in Nigeria and they were not successful also by the uh, Ministry on Environmental Law is still a case if I'm not wrong is still stuck there or in general judicial remedies there uh, were not provided to be effective and uh, um, we didn't know if we could have a case here because um, the, the harm was there, everything was in Nigeria. The connection with VNI was just due to the corporate group, the fact that uh, now is a subsidiary of any, but we were not aware of the um, awareness that ENI had of the situation going there on the ground, going on on the ground. So we, we, we didn't want to risk a legal case here because it has costs and uh, uh, there are more formalities to, to be done. One is the uh, power of attorney, which had to be uh, collected and it depends whether you want to involve the community or whether we want to involve, involve the victim. It's much more complicated, where it's much more easy to go to the uh, mediation like the one on the national contact point. That's why I would say it has also advantages and not just disadvantages. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you all again for, for your uh, interventions and uh, uh, also for the questions that we received. Uh, I now will close this, uh, this webinar. Uh, maybe Claire, you, you also want to have a, a very quick conclusive remarks, but before uh, just allow me to say that uh, I think it was a very rich presentation and I hope that uh, we learned that the Italian framework is complex, but uh, has contains many things that can be useful and, and are actually also innovative in terms of tools that can be used uh, in the business and human rights uh, context. I hope that thanks to the work of, of these academics and uh, um, lawyers and civil society that we, we had here, uh, the Italian government could be a little bit more present in the European and international debate on those issues because there is a lot that can be said uh, and that is a lot to defend. Um, so, yeah, hopefully uh, this also webinar it's part of uh, of this uh, intent to to try to gather more attention uh, over over this instrument. Thank you very much to everyone, and now uh, back to Claire for the conclusion. Thank you, thank you. Well, again, thank you uh, very much to all our speakers. This was uh, absolutely fascinating. And thank you, Madalena, for also bringing in the point of view uh, of the civil society. Uh, this is uh, very, very important. And that is uh, 
um, indeed here the, the idea behind this, this webinar series is to look at other jurisdictions and to see because there's a lot of very um, important positive things that we can learn from each other and lessons that we can learn by looking at the different examples there um, in relation to business and human rights. So I think that's uh, very